I'm going to begin with a little bit of revision of what we did in the last lecture. So the equilibrium state is one where if we give the state a small perturbation, an infinitesimal perturbation, it will tend to return to its original state. And I illustrated that with a mechanical equilibrium of this ball in a deep valley. So if I disturb this ball a little, it will tend to return to its original location. For a pure substance, it's easy to define the equilibrium condition that the free energies of the two phases here must be exactly equal when they are at equilibrium. On this side, only gamma is stable because it's got a lower free energy. And on this side, it's only alpha that is stable. But at this particular point, both phases have exactly the same free energy and therefore they exist together in equilibrium. This is the phase diagram for carbon uh, as a function of pressure and temperature. And these different fields define where particular phases are stable phases. But this point here, for example, defines liquid and vapor being in equilibrium with each other, they have exactly the same free energy at this combination of pressure and temperature, and that applies all along the all points along this phase boundary where liquid and vapor would be in equilibrium with each other. Here we have a triple point, which means that there are three phases, graphite, liquid and diamond, that have exactly the same free energy and therefore they coexist in equilibrium at around 10 gigapascals and something like 4200 Kelvin. When we consider a mixture of different elements rather than a pure substance, uh, the free energy becomes a function of the concentration of uh, the elements. So for example, here, if I have a mixture of A atoms and B atoms in a particular phase, and let's look at this composition X, then the free energy is given by G of X. And that would be different if I had a different concentration. Now I'm going to express the free energy G of X uh, in terms of the intercepts mu A and mu B of the tangent to the free energy curve at the point X. So here is G of X written simply in terms of the intercepts on the pure axes, and this is the concentration of A and the concentration of B. Now the important thing about this is that we have separated the free energy, the total free energy, into components which depend only on A and only on B. So this we call the chemical potential of A atoms in a solution with a concentration X. And that chemical potential is given by the intercept of this tangent on the pure A axis. And similarly, this is called the chemical potential of B atoms. And if X is in mole fraction, then this would be the chemical potential of A, um, in other words, joules per mole. So we are simply multiplying that by the concentration to get the contribution of A atoms in a solution of A and B. Now, what that means when we put two phases uh, together, and they both depend on the concentrations of the pure elements F, E, and C. Here we are plotting the concentration of carbon. Uh, then the free energies will vary as a function of concentration. But if we draw a common tangent to these two curves, then the chemical potential of carbon in gamma and carbon in alpha are equal. And similarly, the chemical potential of iron in the two phases are also equal. That means that the equilibrium compositions are defined by these contact points of the free energy curve with the common tangent. So this is the uh, solubility of carbon in alpha, which is in contact with gamma, and this is the solubility of carbon in gamma, which is in contact with alpha. So even though these concentrations are different, there is no tendency uh, 
for the phases to homogenize because the free energies of the individual elements are uniform across the phases. So equilibrium is defined by drawing a common tangent to these free energy curves. The contact points give you the uh, equilibrium compositions of the two phases and these are the chemical potentials of iron and carbon in both the phases identical. I've used this example previously of uh, almost pure ice uh, in oceanic water which contains a much higher concentration of salt and yet there is no tendency for them to homogenize because if we plot the free energy curves of ice and seawater as a function of the salt concentration then the chemical potential of sodium chloride is uniform across the two phases as is the chemical potential of water. So these are the equilibrium compositions of ice and water and this, uh, this diagram is for a particular temperature. So now I'm going to go into how we can use this kind of information to construct phase diagrams. So I want to illustrate uh, the uses of titanium and molybdenum before going into the phase diagram. So for example, this is a turbine blade uh, which is at the front of an aircraft engine and you can see that it is a huge component and remember that it's rotating uh, while the engine is operating. It's essentially made of titanium containing uh, small concentrations of vanadium and aluminium for other reasons. And this is a picture of a Chinese satellite that I took while I was visiting Shanghai, uh, the Institute of Metals Research in Shanghai. And these panels here are made of molybdenum and you'll see why shortly. Now titanium and molybdenum are interesting in that they can dissolve in each other in the solid or liquid phases at any concentration. So there is complete solid solubility or complete liquid solubility. And the melting temperature of molybdenum is very high. Um, uh, so actually the melting temperature of titanium is also high but that of molybdenum is particularly high which is why it was used as those panels that I illustrated on um, the picture of the satellite. Yeah, they are essentially heat shields. Now above the melting temperature of molybdenum only the liquid phase is stable. So there is no way of drawing for example a common tangent between the solid and liquid free energy curves. Only liquid is stable across the concentration range for temperatures above the melting point of molybdenum. And these are the free energy curves of liquid and solid as a function of temperature. But if we reduce the temperature, for example, to this uh, around 2300 degrees centigrade, then it becomes possible to draw a common tangent between the solid and the liquid phases and to define a phase field here, solid plus liquid. Uh, so all concentrations in between these two points would consist of two phases and that defines this two phase field solid plus liquid and these points represent the equilibrium compositions of solid and liquid which are here and here and the locus of these points will form these phase boundaries here and that's how we generate the entire phase diagram. So we get a two phase field at particular temperatures and concentration. So if your concentration is here, then we would have, and the temperature is here, then we would have a mixture of solid and liquid. You would have to cool further in order to just get solid or just, uh, or heat to just get liquid. Now at a, a low temperature, which is below the melting temperatures of both titanium and molybdenum, only the solid phase is stable. Uh, because the free energy curve here is lower than that of liquid at all concentrations. It's not possible once again to draw any common tangents between these two curves. Okay? So you've seen how we can use thermodynamic functions uh, for each of the phases and you've seen also that they are temperature dependent, their relative positions are temperature dependent. So if we have thermodynamic data for 
um, for example, molybdenum liquid uh, as a function of the concentration of titanium and the solid as a function of the concentration of titanium, then basically this phase diagram can be calculated uh, using the thermodynamic data. Now here we are plotting temperature versus the mole fraction of titanium. And suppose we have an alloy with a composition X bar of 0.4 mole fraction of titanium and it's heated up to 2090 degrees centigrade. Then at this uh, temperature, we would have a mixture of solid of this composition, 0.29 mole fraction of titanium and liquid of this composition, uh, richer in titanium. Now the mole fraction of the solid phase is given by this distance BC divided by the distance AC. This distance here divided by the total distance here. So this is the mole fraction of the solid phase. And similarly, the mole fraction of the liquid phase is this distance AB divided by this total distance AC. And because, uh, you know, for example, in the case of the liquid, we pick this divided by this, it's known as a lever rule this rule for calculating the fractions of the phases. And you can apply to any phase diagram. Um, if your alloy falls in a two-phase field, then you can estimate the fraction of the two phases that exist under equilibrium. Now, there is a, a material known as pewter, uh, which traditionally consists of a mixture of lead and tin, but in modern times, you know, pewter cannot contain lead and therefore, uh, you know, because lead is toxic. So this particular picture is modern pewter made with tin containing copper, bismuth and uh, antimony and bismuth. But if you go back, uh, you know, a long time, uh, this is a picture I took in the Edo Museum in Tokyo. This is pewter, which is made from a mixture of lead and 62% tin. And it has a melting temperature, which is lower than the melting temperatures of lead and tin. And of course, uh, a low melting temperature in those days uh, was a good thing because you could, you could make this metal melt and get into a mold, etc. at a fairly low temperature. Now, why is this temperature lower than both the tin and the lead? You know, in the previous uh, titanium molybdenum phase diagram, that was not the case. Uh, we could either be above the melting temperature of titanium or below the melting temperature of molybdenum. But here you can see that this particular mixture has a melting temperature which is less than that of tin and less than that of lead. And of course that makes it useful for making these uh, um, uh, divide, um, sorry, for making these objects. But why is this lower than these two temperatures? This uh, phase diagram for the lead tin system is quite different from what we had for titanium and molybdenum where we had complete solid solubility and liquid solubility across the concentration range. Here, the solubility of tin in lead is given by this phase boundary. Beyond this concentration, we would get precipitation of beta. And similarly, this phase boundary here defines the solubility of lead in tin. And if you exceed this concentration, we would get the precipitation of alpha. So we get a mixture of two solid phases uh, between these two phase boundaries. Now over here, you can see that as the concentration of tin in lead increases, we get a reduction in the melting temperature. Similarly, when the concentration of lead in tin increases, we get a reduction in melting temperature and that there is a point here where liquid, if you cool the liquid, it will decompose simultaneously into a mixture of alpha and beta over a very, very narrow temperature range. Okay, So this is known as a eutectic composition where liquid decomposes into mixture of alpha and beta. Uh, 
So this is the eutectic composition and this is the eutectic temperature of 183 degrees centigrade. Of course, uh, you can have compositions across the range and alloys in this domain are known as hypoeutectic and in this domain as hypereutectic. So if I have an alloy of this composition, as I cool the liquid, I will first get the precipitation of beta and then the uh, when I get the precipitation of beta, which is poor in lead, the liquid will become richer and richer in lead and its composition moves down this phase boundary while the composition of the beta moves down this phase boundary and eventually the remaining liquid will decompose into a mixture of alpha and beta. So the reason why um, you know, pewter was made of a particular lead tin alloy which had a eutectic composition is simply that you get to a very low melting temperature of 183 degrees centigrade. Now in terms of uh, free energy diagrams let's consider the cooling of a composition here which is the eutectic composition from high temperatures and at high temperatures that eutectic composition which falls somewhere here would only have liquid phase stable okay uh, these common tangents here represent the liquid plus beta and the liquid plus alpha phase fields but our composition is here and that composition would give us simply liquid at a temperature above 183 degrees centigrade but at 183 degrees centigrade the liquid is able to decompose simultaneously into alpha and beta here. If you, uh, the three phases have a common tangent and therefore they are all in equilibrium at the eutectic temperature and as you cool a little bit below the eutectic temperature you get beta and alpha growing together from the liquid phase and this is known as a eutectic mixture of alpha and beta. So liquid decomposes simultaneously into a mixture of alpha and beta. This is the common transformation front between the liquid and the eutectic microstructure here, just below 183 degrees centigrade. And the compositions of the alpha and beta are given by this point here, okay, this, this composition here, alpha in equilibrium with liquid, and the composition of the beta is given by this point here where beta is in equilibrium with liquid of this composition at the eutectic temperature. Now I'm going to show you a simulation of a eutectic mixture growing from the liquid. Okay, So here we have the black and the white phases growing at a common transformation front from the red liquid and I'd like you to notice that the diffusion fields ahead of the black and the white phases here. Uh, the, this is the diffusion field of solute. Um, one of the phases is rich in, uh, in um, solute and the other one is poor in solute. So we get diffusion simply in this direction. And it's a very limited diffusion field because the average composition of the eutectic solid is the same as that of the liquid. So that is why this reaction can happen very rapidly because you're not enriching the liquid with solute which would then slow down the transformation. Okay, The diffusion is basically going from a solute poor to a solute rich phase and doesn't extend much at all into the liquid. The far field liquid remains of the same composition as the average alloy composition. So eutectic uh, transformations can be quite rapid compared with uh, other transformations in hypoeutectic and hypereutectic alloys where the composition of the liquid actually changes when you precipitate a phase before the eutectic temperature is reached. Now it's interesting to ask why the eutectic reaction happens at all. Uh, we've already got one reason that when the mixture, the solid mixture which has the eutectic microstructure of alternating alpha and beta, uh, 
has the same average composition as the liquid. So solute does not need to diffuse and enrich the liquid at all. Okay. So that makes the reaction rapid. Uh, now the second uh, point actually opposes a eutectic reaction because in the process we are creating lots of interfaces between the alpha and beta. So here I'm taking a very simple view of the eutectic mixture where we have a cube with a, a side 2s where s is the interlamellar spacing between say the alpha phase and the eutectic. So inside this cube we have two interfaces here between alpha and beta one interface here between alpha and beta and another interface here between alpha and beta. So the amount of surface that I have per unit volume is 4 times 2s squared divided by 2s cubed. And if you work that out, the amount of surface per unit volume is simply 2 over the spacing of the lamella. And the energy that is locked in this surface per unit volume is simply the interfacial energy per unit area multiplied by S sub V which is sigma into 2 over the interlamellar spacing. What this means is that the cost of creating these interfaces uh, limits the interlamellar spacing. So if your driving force for transformation is small, that means you're at a small undercooling below this eutectic temperature then S will tend to be coarse because the free energy cannot accommodate otherwise a finer interlamellar spacing. So if you want a finer spacing, then you've got to undercool the liquid much more below the eutectic temperature in order to provide the energy to create these interfaces. So just to summarize, uh, a eutectic happens rapidly because the diffusion field is localized at the transformation front and you don't enrich the parent phase when the eutectic grows from the parent phase for a binary system. But the cost of creating interfaces means that the interlamellar spacing between the alpha and beta phases um, can only be fine if we undercool a lot below the transformation temperature. Of course, this is important because we may want to control the interlamellar spacing in order to achieve a particular strength. Now, all the examples that I've given you so far have been from metallic uh, elements, but you know, eutectics also happen in oxides and ceramics. So here, for example, is a phase diagram between uh, uh, alumina and uh, the gadolinium aluminium oxide. Here we are plotting the amount of uh, uh, gadolinium oxide and uh, we have a eutectic here. Notice that there's no two-phase field on this side or a very, 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 very thin two-phase field on both sides because the solubility of gadolinium oxide in alumina is more or less zero and similarly the solubility of alumina in gadolinium oxide is more or less zero. Okay, So unlike the uh, lead tin diagram, there is no mutual solubility of these two oxide uh, of uh, alumina and gadolinium oxide in each other. And here we have the liquid plus alumina phase field and the liquid plus gadolinium aluminium oxide phase field. And here is our eutectic uh, composition and eutectic temperature. And this is what the mixture of the two kinds of oxides looks like in three dimensionals when you directionally solidify the eutectic. Okay? So eutectics are not limited to metals, they can happen also in oxide systems. Okay, let's uh, now consider what happens when our alloy composition is not the eutectic composition, but either less than the eutectic composition or greater than the eutectic composition. Hypo-eutectic or hyper-eutectic. We'll only do one example because the two cases are very similar. So supposing we take an alloy of this composition and allow the liquid to cool, uh, 
So this alloy would have a concentration of tin which is less than your tactic and the temperature is greater than the tactic temperature of 183 degrees. So we are cooling this uh, and the first thing that happens is the precipitation of pro-eutectic alpha here. We call it pro-eutectic because it's before the eutectic temperature is reached. And these would be grains of alpha or dendrites of alpha forming in the liquid. And in the process, because the alpha is poorer in solute than the liquid, the liquid will become enriched in tin compared with the alpha. You know, the liquid can dissolve more of tin than the alpha can. And therefore, as the material cools under equilibrium conditions, the composition of the liquid will follow this phase boundary and the composition of the solid alpha will follow this phase boundary. So the liquid is getting richer in tin as solidification proceeds. So initially we have liquid going to enriched liquid, right? liquid which is enriched in tin, uh, plus uh, alpha which we say is pro-eutectic alpha because it's formed above the eutectic temperature. Now, once this uh, reaches the eutectic temperature, 183 degrees centigrade, the remaining liquid will also have reached the eutectic composition and therefore it decomposes into a mixture of alpha and beta, which is the eutectic phase illustrated here. So the microstructure looks quite different that we have a pro-eutectic phase alpha and then a mixture of alpha and beta which forms the eutectic microstructure. This is the aluminum silicon phase diagram and aluminum silicon alloys are used to make these engine blocks for internal combustion engines in cars. Uh, they used to be made of cast iron but obviously this is much lighter. They have uh, very good casting properties in terms of uh, volume change and also the melting temperature because they are they are slightly off the eutectic composition here, um, perhaps uh, about 10 weight percent of silicon. And when the material is cooled, to, uh, the first phase to form will be a pro eutectic aluminium rich phase, and followed by this eutectic mixture of silicon and aluminium. Now the silicon has almost zero solubility for aluminium, whereas aluminium can dissolve uh, a certain amount of silicon. In fact, the alloy is not just a mixture of aluminium and silicon, there are other elements included. Um, I won't go into them, but the point is that so far we have only considered a binary phase diagram. Uh, and you know, in a binary we can plot temperature versus composition. What happens when we have more than two elements in the system? In other words, more than one solute. Well, obviously when we have three elements involved and we want to plot against temperature, then we have to use a three-dimensional diagram such as this. So here we have A, B and C and temperature is being plotted on the vertical axis. And you can see that they look complicated and it's very hard uh, to draw these diagrams in such a way that you can read off values uh, just as we did in the binary phase diagram. The principle is the same, that the chemical potential of A, B and C must be identical in all of the phases at equilibrium. But nevertheless, this is not uh, very nice to look at. So what we do instead uh, of plotting A, B and C versus temperature is we take sections of this diagram, ternary sections. And here is an example where we have a mixture of titanium, aluminium and nickel. And these are the phases that are stable. Here gamma of this composition is in equilibrium with gamma prime of this composition. Uh, in this triangle we have gamma, theta and gamma prime all in equilibrium and so on. So obviously things are getting complicated and this only represents a section of the 
titanium aluminum nickel phase diagram at a particular temperature and if you want to look at a different temperature the phase diagrams will also look different here is another isothermal section taken from the iron chromium carbon system where we have many different kinds of uh, compounds that can form between chromium iron and carbon and you can see that it looks uh, complicated uh, it's for a particular temperature 700 Kelvin but you know real materials often have more than three elements in the system so if you think about four elements then a diagram like this would change into a three-dimensional object okay, at, at a particular temperature and pressure. So that becomes really difficult because even at a constant temperature we would need to examine sections of this diagram. So what I'm getting to is that it may not be reasonable to think in terms of diagrams when it comes to systems containing more than two or three elements so the question then arises you know what do we actually get from phase diagrams uh, what information do we access from phase diagrams and is that in information identical for any number of elements involved in the system so first of all we need to know for any combination of temperature pressure and com chemical composition what are the stable phases? We need to know the fractions of each of those phases for the particular composition of interest. Uh, and we need to know the chemical compositions of each of the phases involved as a function of variables such as temperature and pressure. So those are the things that we look for in a phase diagram. And I'm going to show you now a system containing seven components, iron, carbon, silicon, manganese, and so forth, and three phases possible in this system. And we are not going to draw a diagram at all, okay? Basically, equilibrium can be determined just by making sure that the chemical potentials are uniform across the phases and across all the components in our system and you know that applies even for a ternary system where we have three elements that is these free energy curves are actually free energy surfaces in three dimensions and we draw a common tangent plane here and where it touches those surfaces gives us the equilibrium compositions of alpha and gamma at the temperature of interest but I said to you that I don't want to draw diagrams anymore because it will get impossibly complicated as we go to more than three elements. All we need is for the chemical potentials of each and every element to be identical in each and every phase. And we can do this if we have thermodynamic data, we can simply calculate the point where these chemical potentials are identical. And I gave you an example uh, previously but this is uh, the case uh, at 743K for the iron, carbon, silicon, manganese, nickel, moly, chrome system and at ambient pressure. And we've got three phases stable at this particular temperature. So we know which phases are stable. We know the quantities of each of these phases because this is the amount of each phase in the number of moles. And we know the chemical composition of each phase here. So this, for example, is the chemical composition of BCC across all seven elements. And similarly, we know the chemical composition of cementite and of M23C6. So all the information that you get from a diagram is actually available in numbers and much more easy, easier to interpret than drawing complicated diagrams. So that deals with uh, my information on phase diagrams and I'm going to move on to discuss the meaning of a solution in the thermal. Now I've previously mentioned the concept of an ideal solution where you know A and B atoms mix at random uh, and uh, basically there is no enthalpy of mixing. We only consider the entropy of mixing. So the free energy of mixing 
is simply given by uh, Na, which is Avogadro's number, the Boltzmann constant, and temperature times this term, which we derived from the configurational entropy. So there's no entropy of mixing and only an entropy of mixing. So if the concentration of A atoms is 1 minus x, then the chance of finding an A atom is also 1 minus x. And if we consider the number of AA pairs in our random mixture, then that will be equal to the chance of finding an A atom, which is 1 minus x, and multiplied by the chance of finding another A atom, which is also 1 minus x, and therefore we have 1 minus x squared, the number of atoms, and we divide by 2 because we can't distinguish uh, A, A, and this first A, and the second A, and the second A, and the first A atoms. Okay, So the number of A, A pairs is simply half n into 1 minus x squared. And similarly, the probability of finding a B atom is x, and therefore the probability of finding a pair of B atoms is x squared. And again, we have this factor of half because we can't distinguish these atoms. Now, the chance of finding an A atom is 1 minus x, and a B atom next to it is 1 minus x times x. So this is the number of AB pairs that we have in, in this uh, system. Now, there are very, very few ideal solutions in nature. Uh, this is uh, an example, praseodymium and neodymium. They form an almost ideal solution because they have the same crystal structure, the same number of valence electrons, their metallic radii are very similar, the density is not that different, and similarly the electronegativity of these uh, atoms uh, is similar. So they have very similar characteristics, and when you mix them, they don't mind which kind of atom is next to them. So they form an almost ideal solution. So the, uh, for example, the entropy of solution does not change with the mole fraction of neodymium. But in reality, there are very few um, solutions which are ideal. In other words, have a random mixture of atoms. So this free energy of mixing that we calculate from the entropy of mixing of an ideal solution is not likely to be the correct representation of the free energy of a real solution where you know you do get changes in bonding when you break AA bonds and BB bonds and form two AB bonds. So we need to have a more sophisticated equation than this. Now, a regular solution is a solution in which there is, in fact, a finite enthalpy of mixing. Okay, So when you break AA bonds and BB bonds and form AB bonds, there is actually a change in energy associated with that. So in addition to the ideal solution free energy of mixing term, we have a second term here, which is the excess free energy of mixing that consists of two terms here the enthalpy change when we form new bonds and contributions from entropy because thermal vibrations etc may make contributions to entropy other than just configurational entropy. So if you focus on this, this represents the change in bond energy when an AA and a BB bond is replaced in part by AB and BA bond. So let's see how we can express that uh, a bit. Now you must have come across a diagram like this uh, where we look at two atoms which are located an infinite distance apart and we bring them together, decrease their spacing uh, and they will interact Okay, and go through a minimum here. When you try to push them together beyond a certain point, they don't want to be pushed and therefore the energy rises here. So this would be the separation, the ideal separation of the two atoms, and that represents a, a decrease in energy. In other words, you formed a bond uh, relative to the point where they were infinitely separated. And I, I've written this as minus 2 epsilon AA. This kind of a curve actually has many uses. Uh, for example, 
it determines the modulus of the material and so on. So you can in fact calculate these curves using first principles methods, but that's another story. Uh, all I want to do know is that when I bring two A atoms next to each other, they will form a bond with a reduction in energy of minus two epsilon AA. Okay, so let's look at probabilities again. So I have a, a linear chain of atoms of A and B, and the concentration of A atoms is one minus X, the mole fraction of B atoms is X. Then what is the probability of finding a B atom? Well, it's simply X, and the probability of finding two B atoms next to each other is the probability of finding a B atom multiplied by the probability of finding another B atom. Straightforward, that's what we used uh, in the earlier slide. However, uh, the atoms uh, inside uh, our material are not arranged in straight lines uh, in, in a linear formation. They might uh, be a three-dimensional, but I'll take the example of a two-dimensional arrangement. So I not only have bonds along this line, but also along here, okay? So we have different probabilities of finding B and of, uh, of finding uh, BB pairs the probability of finding a B atom is still identical to just X. But we have to take account of the fact that the atoms are surrounded in three dimensions, not just along one dimension. So the chances of an AA pair are greater than what we did for just a linear arrangement of uh, atoms because the atoms are actually surrounded by uh, other atoms in other directions. So we define a coordination number Z. So for example, in a BCC lattice, the central atom would be surrounded by eight near neighbors. So the coordination number would be eight. Uh, so the chances of an A pair are the probability of an A atom times the probability of finding another A atom times a coordination number, and then these terms which you are familiar with. And similarly of BB, bonds and of forming two a uh, forming an ab bond and a ba bond by breaking this and this apart so we have the numbers of these bonds if we knew the energies of each of these bonds then we could work out an enthalpy of mixing and that energy is simply given by the coordination number times the avogadro's number because we're looking at the molar quantity uh, the probability of an A atom and a B atom multiplied by the energies of the bonds. So uh, this energy represents uh, what happens when you break an AA bond and a BB bond and create two AB bonds. So it's the energy of the AB bonds less the energy of the original AA bond and the BB bond. Okay. So the enthalpy of mixing depends on this and this is a term which we can obtain experimentally or by calculation. So I've plotted some curves here for the free energy of mixing uh, in a regular solution. That means where the enthalpy of mixing is finite. So we're plotting the free energy of mixing versus the concentration of B. If there was no enthalpy of mixing, we would get the ideal solution curve here with a minimum at 0 0.5 of B. Um, and if the enthalpy of mixing favors the formation of AB bonds, then it will be less than zero. And we will get a much deeper minimum, uh, again favoring the formation of near neighbor pairs which are unlike atoms. Okay, So you can see that if the atoms prefer to, next, to be next to unlike atoms, then we get a deeper minimum compared with the ideal solution. On the other hand, if the enthalpy of mixing is greater than zero, uh, which effectively means that the atoms prefer to be next to their own kind, then you get minima at the A-rich and the B-rich locations. Uh, so the atoms will tend to cluster into A-rich and B-rich regions. Uh, and there is a role of temperature because temperature doesn't like 
this kind of separation of atoms. If the temperature increased, increases, then the minima get much, much smaller and eventually, <coughs> and eventually you get complete mixing rather like this curve. So temperature favors the mixing of everything, even if the enthalpy change is greater than zero. In other words, it favors the clustering of atoms. So we've covered two solution models, the ideal model and the regular solution model. And essentially that describes how we can handle the thermodynamics of a solution, which is a mixture of A and B, whether or not uh, there is an enthalpy of mixing uh, to take into account. Thank you.